بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم تو دس بک پولانی از گریٹ ٹرانسفارمیشن دس از ون آف دا موسٹ امپورٹنٹ بکس ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ کیونکہ اٹ ڈسکرائبز ہاؤ دا کرنٹ سسٹم آف کیپٹلزم اروز فرام ڈفرینٹ سسٹم تو In a separate paper, I have uh, explained what the basic thesis of Polanyi is. Uh, this uh, particular paper is concerned not with the, what Polanyi is saying, but with how he came to these conclusions. And these, this is very valuable. So what methodology did he use? That's very valuable. And because this methodology is one that we can use today to study economics correctly as opposed to the incorrect methodology that is currently being taught all over the world uh, using uh, basically theories of human behavior which are completely false and have no match with the reality of human behavior. Using theory of the firm which is completely false has no match with the reality of firm behavior. Using theory of price, uh, consumers say you get the demand curve, firms say you get the supply curve, and then you put them together to get the price, equilibrium price. That's also completely wrong. And <coughs> price is not determined in equilibrium by supply and demand. So basically everything that is taught in economics is wrong. Uh, so now how can we do things which are right? So basically, I said that the conventional methodology of economics is founded on the basis of logical positivism. It says we only look at observables. We don't ask people about how they feel or what they prefer. We ask them to make choices because the feeling is unobservable and doesn't matter. The choice is observable. It matters. Our theories don't need to match human behavior. When I make a consumer decision, I know that in my heart there is no utility function, but it doesn't matter. The, uh, the, this is not allowed to count as evidence. Uh, all we need to show is that there is a function which exists which can match your behavior. Whether or not I use such a function, whether or not max I, makes no difference. Now, The thing is, that logical positivism was solidly rejected. Yani philosophers said that this theory is wrong and there were so many reasons why it uh, didn't work out. But uh, the foundations of economics, which are based on logical positivism, were never revised. So currently, too, the foundations of uh, uh, economic theory are completely wrong. One of the simple things is that economics claims to be a positive science. Um, I have a paper which is called The Normative Foundations of Scarcity in which I showed that the most fundamental concept on which all of economics is built, which is scarcity, is a normative concept and not an objective one. And I have shown that there are three normative uh, principles which are used to, cons- uh, to make scarcity the prime defining characteristic of economics. So basically, economics is fundamentally flawed and uh, this lecture is about how we can fix it, not, not about the flaws. The flaws I have discussed elsewhere. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the basic uh, issue is that the positivist uh, misconception is that economic theories are scientific laws. So scientific laws ki property, they have the property that they are invariants. They are the same across time and space. So an economic theory should apply the same to China, to Brazil, to India, to England. And it should apply the same in the 18th century and in the 19th century and in the 20th century. It is almost obvious that there is no such law. There is, if, if I want to analyze the economics of Pakistan, then I have to look at many things which are very particular 
has to do with what is the situation right now, whether there are tractors or not, how much, uh, what, are the, uh, what is the level of education of the farmers, etc. And this is true only for Pakistan in uh, 2016. And, and if I say that I want to think about those things which are invariant, which are the same whether you are looking at Mexico or whether you are looking at Europe, then there will be very few such things. There will be some things which are the same, but if I want to do a serious and detailed and in-depth analysis of Pakistan's economy, I cannot do so on the basis of laws which are universal invariants. So, <clears throat> this basic positivist idea uh, makes it impossible for us to develop a good theory about Pakistani economics. So, you see, what I am saying is that uh, if you think about Keynes, now we studied the ISLM curve and this and that and the other, uh, but we did not study the Great Depression. Now the thing is that Keynesian economics was developed because of the Great Depression. Yani Keynes, uh, everybody, including Keynes, Keynes himself was a classical economist and he believed in all of those things which and when he saw the Great Depression, he said, oh, my theories are wrong. Because the theory, one of the great predictions of the classical theory was that there cannot be long-term persistent unemployment because the uh, supply and demand will uh, eliminate, the wage, wage will fall and the uh, excess supply of labor will finish. But that did not happen for more than 15 years. You had high... Uh, unemployment. Basically the unemployment continued until the world war uh, which uh, changed the situation drastically. So it was obvious to everybody that the um, after the Great Depression that classical does not work. So Keynes started thinking about how I can uh, make a theory in which the labor market does not equilibrate. So he created, developed a theory, but the thing is that to understand Keynesian theory, you have to understand the historical context. You cannot understand Keynesian theory without understanding the Great Depression. Basically all social science is like that. In social science we do not develop theories which are scientific theories which are invariant across time and space and they apply to all people at all times. When we develop a theory, it is to solve some problem that we are facing historically. So it has context, it is historically situated, it is uh, also situated in, in a nation. So that's why also European social science was developed to solve problems that Europeans had in their um, situation and those things cannot be taken over without. Uh, the, the mistaken idea that these are scientific theories says that okay, we take the theory developed in uh, Europe and we apply it to Pakistan, it would not work because the circumstances are not the same. But this mistaken idea of logical positivism that uh, this in fact the, even the word social science reflects this mistake. Social study is not a science because it's uh, particular. It uh, depends on history. It depends on human behavior. Human behavior is different. It's unique. <coughs> So now I, I come to what Polanyi has to say. So <clears throat> this is uh, basically he says that things are going along in history and then there is some change, some external stimulus, something which comes out of the society which is you can say exogenous in economics. So now this creates social change. So now people start thinking that something is changing and what can we do? But one very important thing to understand, which again positivism distorts, is that you know, when you have a sequence of events, see, um, to understand these events requires some interpretation. <clears throat> this is a sort of a philosophical point that if you have two events, event A happens and then event B happens, uh, you can say that A caused B. Of course, this is known as the 
post hoc ergo proctor hoc fallacy. Because just because B happened after A doesn't mean that A caused B. Causes may be elsewhere. So the thing is that where are the causes? This cannot be discovered by observation. This is one of the key, uh, one of the very important uh, contributions which Hume noted that causality is not something which is observable. This is very crucial point that causality is never observable. You can only observe uh, the sequence of events. You cannot observe the causal relationship. Causal relationship is deep and hidden. It is not observable. So according to positivism, it doesn't exist. <coughs> now, the reality is that causality is all important and it is not observable. So what do we do? Well, what happens is that we make up stories. So we have to put causality on top of the observable. So this, different people have different ideas that say, okay, the World War I happened. Why, why did it happen? Now, many people have come up, there's a huge, why did the Great Depression happen? There are at least uh, seven or eight different stories about why it happened. And everybody has, now the thing is that when you talk about causes, you can never discover them and uh, they can never really be pinned down because they are not observable. But you can find some things, some, some causes are more plausible than others. So <clears throat> basically what happens is that uh, human beings, in order to be able to understand what is going on, they have to add something to the events. It's not enough to observe. Add a theory of causation. So they invent some theory to explain what is happening. So that is how social theories emerge. And this is what I am saying, that theories have to be understood in the context of history. So Keynes developed a theory to explain why the unemployment did not go away after the Great Depression and why uh, unemployment happened. <coughs> so now the thing is that uh, this theory is used not only to understand the event but to uh, create a response to the event because once you understand the causes then in the light of your theory, you can say, okay, now the theory says this is the cause. The cause of the, for example, we can oversimplify Keynes and say that, okay, the cause of the unemployment is fixed wages. So what we do, we, we can um, eliminate the wage rigidity somehow. Actually, this is doing injustice to Keynes because Keynes clearly said that my theory does not depend on, uh, on rigid wages. Uh, they are deeper issues, but at this moment I am just simplifying. So, <coughs> so false theories are used to create a response and then because people respond, so this actually shapes history. So false theories are shaping history. So now, you see, um, the positivist analysis of theories says that when you take a theory, <coughs> Uh, you should assess whether this theory is true or it is false. If it is false, it's useless. And if it's true, then it's good. But actually, the reality is more complicated than that. What happens is that theories are not to be judged purely on their true-false value. Well, the theory emerged, Keynesian theory emerged. The Keynesian theory says that the government should intervene. Now, Keynesian theory may or may not be right. In fact, uh, we know for sure that there are some errors in the Keynesian theory. But whatever it was, it was used to craft policy. So now we have to understand the theory. The theory actually shaped history, just like Marxism. Marx had a theory. Where did Marx's theory come from? Well, basically, in uh, under the capitalist system, Marx lived in England and he saw the horrible <coughs> treatment that was given to the laborers that has been described in the novels of Charles Dickens about how conditions were very bad in English factories. And he said that <coughs> these people, the laborers, are being exploited by the capitalists and they will not, uh, uh, they, they are many of them and the capitalists are few, so they will revolt against this eventually. 
But this was, so the theory is, was created out of Marx's observations of conditions in England. Now, this theory actually shaped history in the sense that Russian Revolution and Chinese Revolution and many other places, they were inspired by <coughs> the vision of Marx that everyone should have uh, equal opportunities to to earn and to be part. So from the, the motto is that from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So everyone, ev everyone's need should be looked after. So this was a, one of the, and then this theory actually shaped history. So <coughs> now you see this is very different from the positivist idea of theories which we have learned that the theory is independent. I mean, this, is, this comes from science. In science, when I make a theory about electrons and about gravity, the electrons are not listening to me and are not going to react that, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. <coughs> so my theories and the system about which I'm theorizing are completely independent. I can make a wrong theory or a right theory. It will not have any effect on the system. But in human beings, this is, it's not like that. If I make a wrong theory about, uh, for example, if I make a theory that today all the problems of the uh, world are caused by Islamic terrorists, then we will craft policies which will say, okay, this is the biggest problem in the world, so we have to find out how to solve this. And it may be that there are many other problems which we are neglecting, and maybe that this, but what will happen in history will depend <coughs> on this theory. So the theory actually interacts. So in that sense, <coughs> um, the positivist view is that the acceptance or rejection of theory depends on whether it's true or false. This is wrong. Keynesian theory became accepted because it provided an explanation for the prolonged unemployment, for the Great Depression. Nobody else could do that. In particular, a very good economic theory was the institutionalist school, which was the strongest up until the Great Depression and basically institutional economics went into collapse or uh, uh, out, uh, out of favor because it could not explain the Great Depression because institutional economics is not designed to explain one-time events, it's designed to explain the big picture. And so similarly, Hayek and uh, liberal free market theories which were very popular prior to the Great they they went out of fashion. Hayek was eventually won a Nobel Prize, but only after free market theory came back into fashion following uh, Reagan-Thatcher era. <coughs> so basically we see that the acceptance or rejection of theories does not have to do with whether it's true or false, which is one of the key positivist ideas. <coughs> so. If we want to do social science correctly, we have to do analysis on three levels. First, we have to look at the historical context. And we have to look at the society. Who, is, who are the actors? What are the different groups? What are the common interests of the different groups? So that requires basically a description of what is going on in history at that point in time. Who are the groups? Who are the actors in the stage? At the second level, <coughs> then we look at the problems that different groups are facing and what are the theories that the different groups are using to analyze history and to shape their response to history. Because, you see, this is the key thing that history is just a collection of events. You cannot understand a collection of events until you have a theory. The theory is given by you. It is imposed. It doesn't exist in reality. You see, this is another you know, positivist misconception is that we analyze the events and from the events we extract the theory. So the events will actually tell us what the theory is. But as I said, the key issue of causality is not there in the events for us to see. It has to be supplied by us. <coughs> so theories are independent of the observation to some extent. So we develop this theory. Uh, so we understand this theory as th the theory will be determined by the interests of the groups. Yani, uh, suppose that there is low productivity. The landlords will say that the low productivity in agriculture is because of the existence of the small farms. 
they have low productivity. So we should uh, we should uh, create monopolies. We should create large farms. Uh, the small landlords will create a theory which says that no, the big landlords are very inefficient and both will be able to find the data to support their theories. So now the question is which theory will emerge? Well, whoever has the greater power. Uh, so that's uh, the thing that, that will emerge. So <coughs> the, uh, it is not that simple. I mean, uh, power is an important fact. But basically, theories emerge by consensus. So, <clears throat> so consensus is built on the basis of two pillars. One is the power which creates the possibility of coercion, pressurizing, forcing people. And the other uh, pillar is persuasion, uh, getting people to agree to what you have to say. So in the persuasion, truth is very important factor. That's why truth is powerful because it can create consensus and so, but, but it is not all powerful. There are many, many cases where true stories have been, uh, true theories have been ignored and neglected and false theories which favor the <coughs> conqueror have been uh, widely accepted. So, uh, so one of the um, important insights of Polanyi is that theories are situated historically. They are not independent invariant scientific truths uh, truths so for example this is uh, yani today we are talking about pakistani policy and we are saying that okay fdi is uh, needed and uh, export promotion is needed this is all theories that we have absorbed by examining any for example it is thought that uh, the east asian miracle was due to exports and in fact, you observe that East uh, Asian economies grew rapidly and they did a lot of exporting. So now, if we have this theory, which happens to be a false theory, then we will say, okay, uh, we will uh, now, if we want to be like them, then we should focus on export promotion. Now, a deeper analysis of the <coughs> East Asian economy shows that export happened export miracle happened after the economies became strong. So it was not that the uh, growth was caused by export promotion, it was that the export promotion was caused by the economic growth. So for us to focus on export promotion is just an entirely wrong idea. But this will happen because uh, if, uh, if we uh, look at uh, the models of history and we try to analyze them and we create a theory, then this theory will guide us to this action. So now one of the key ideas, the uh, a second key idea of uh, Polanyi is that the institutional structure of a society is like the body and the institutions embody uh, spirits and intentions. So you have to look at both of them. Again, this is very much against positivist ideas. So, <clears throat> uh, so let us illustrate this idea. There is a spirit and there is a flesh. The spirit is the, uh, the thing that the society wants to achieve as a goal. And then the institutions that emerge capture <coughs> that spirit because you are trying to translate your spirit into uh, reality and the only way to do that is to create institutions. So uh, one of the prime examples is the emergence of secular thought and then the secular institutions of democracy and banking and uh, certain other. <coughs> so basically uh, what happened again to understand secular uh, secularism you have to understand the historical context. So the historical context was that the um, popes became very corrupt. So in response to this corruption of popes, Martin Luther created the Protestant church and then the Protestant and Catholics had massive amount of very violent, very bloody fights and there were massacres on both sides and cruelty and ruthlessness. And so the people of Europe got sick and tired of religion. 
This included the religious people. <coughs> Religion was a dominant. It was not that the, everybody became atheist. Very few atheists, and very few secular thinkers. But even the religious people saw that when we are in power, we can make, uh, we can uh, uh, oppress the others. But when the other side gains power, then they oppress us. So they said, okay, let's take religion out of the picture, and let's uh, create a theory which is based on uh, logic without reference to any religion. That is the basic idea of secular thinking. So then, <clears throat> freedom became a crucial value because now in a secular society, your main goal is that different people of different religions who are actually quite strongly enemies of each other, they should learn to live together in peace. <coughs> so how can this, how can we do that? Well, allow everybody freedom. Let them be free to do what they want and let the other group be free to do that, that one. Now, you see, freedom is not, was never a value and is still not a value in Islam, for example, and is not, is not a value for anybody because freedom is freedom to do something. It is a, it's a means. It is not, it's means to a goal. It is not the goal itself. You see, so if I want to do something, I want to be an engineer. Uh, this is my desire in life. Oh, if somebody prevents me to do that, then I will be unhappy. If, I, if somebody tells me that you are not free, your only choice is that you can be an engineer. I will have no problem with that. So it's not freedom I want. I want freedom because it will allow me to do what I want. Not that freedom itself is something which is valuable. But this, uh, similarly wealth, wealth is, uh, is a means to an end. If I have wealth, it is of no use to me unless I can use it to achieve those things, to, to buy those things that I want. If, if I have a lot of wealth but I can't buy anything with it, then it's useless. So it's not a goal in itself. <clears throat> so what happened in a secular society is that these means to goals became goals. Which is very strange. I mean, Max Weber, who is a very brilliant sociologist, he noticed this. He said that capitalism, the spirit of, uh, of capitalism is to acquire wealth for itself, which is actually absolutely irrational thing to do. But this is nonetheless what capitalism was, is all about. And we can see it all around us. People say, okay, what is your goal in life? My goal is to earn a million dollars. What will you do with it? I'll think about that when I acquire it. Now, this man, man spent all his life acquiring a million dollars. In the process, he loses his family, he loses his children. Then he has a million dollars. Now, what are you going to do with it? You can't buy happiness. <coughs> so, but this is, the, this is the training that is being given to everybody. I mean, this is what's in the air. <coughs> and <coughs> the, you can, uh, the attitude towards wealth change. This is part of the great transformation of uh, of Polari. And, and a very uh, easy illustration of that is if you look at Dickens' A Christmas Story, in this there is a character which is called uh, Scrooge, and he is a miser. And basically, in Dickens' story, he learns that being miser is, is a very bad thing, and he has a dream in which he says he will, go to, he will die and he will go to hell unless uh, he repents. And then he becomes generous and he gives his money to one of his laborers who is very poor. And so, basically, it's a story, which it is a morality story, which says that you should not be miserly, you should not collect wealth. Now, if you look at Disney cartoons, there is a Scrooge McDuck. Now, this he is, he also has lots of money, but this time there is no, no judge, no moral judgment being attached. He is, uh, he has lots of money because he is very clever, and this is a good thing, and he is very smart and tough, and that's uh, so he is a lovable character according to. So this change, this is the change in terms of attitude towards money. This is part of the great transformation which took place. <coughs> so I am going to present three methodological principles which come out of Polanyi's analysis and which are exactly directly opposed to the principles that we are uh, using in conventional economic theory. One of them is uh, which uh, Polanyi uses, methodologic, I have named it methodological communitarianism. Uh, Polanyi uses this principle without actually giving it a name. 
So actually today, uh, for various reasons which are too complex to go into, uh, economics is firmly committed to a methodological principle which is called methodological individualism. It says that if I can understand the behavior of one individual, then I can understand the behavior of everything. After all, a society is uh, consists of just a collection of individuals. So if I can understand the behavior of all the individuals, then um, I have everything. So this is called methodological individualism, where you say that you don't have to analyze groups. You only need to analyze individuals. <coughs> now the opposite to that is that, no, you can't understand in this, uh, history, you can't understand economics without looking at groups of people who have common interests. So basically, uh, individuals acting on their own cannot bring about any change. When you have social change when you have basically society consists of groups society does not consist of individuals and different groups acting according to their interests are uh, what creates history so collective action creates history uh, there are many things like you see for example suppose we decide to uh, <coughs> uh, drive on the right hand side of the road. So this is a collective decision and everybody must follow it and it's, it's arbitrary but whether we drive on the right or the left but it is a collective decision. As an individual I cannot decide this on my own and this decision cannot be understood as a collection of individual decisions. <coughs> it has to be made <coughs> together. If uh, everybody is free to decide on his own whether he should drive on the right or the left, there will be many accidents. Then this is just one example. Basically, there is a lot of things which are created by social consensus. We all agree that this is what should be the case. And because of this agreement, uh, that, is, uh, that becomes uh, accepted. We, we agree as a society that these are the norms of behavior. If somebody does against this, uh, like homosexuality for example, then this will be considered as a bad thing. If we change this decision, then the society will change, but it is a, it is a collective decision. So this is not an individual's decision. So basically, if you want to understand social change, then you have to understand the behavior of groups. So this is one of the key any principles when Polanyi is analyzing history is looking at different groups and what their interests are and how they act together to achieve that interest and basically this is the thing that in, in uh, Marxist analysis you have the capitalists and you have the laborers and their collective action is the basis of change. In Pakistan you see if you apply without thinking that where are the capitalists and where are the laborers uh, you will not get anywhere because again you are borrowing a theory which was developed to understand a different society. Here we also have groups, we have landlords, we have peasants, we have uh, people who speak Urdu, basically I think the biggest uh, class distinction here is between English speaking and uh, non-English speaking. That is the point at which we would start our analysis if we wanted to do Pakistani society. But the basic point is that you have to think about groups, their common interests and how they are what kind of, how much power do the different groups have and how they interact and what are the theories they are using to analyze the world. <coughs> so this, this is entirely a different way of thinking about science from uh, logical positivism. Okay, one very important thing is that humans have agency, that is, we can change things. According to conventional positivist theories, humans are just like particles, they are, obey certain laws and in economics we do that. Uh, we say, okay, every human being is going to maximize utility. I can predict his behavior because he cannot go right or left. So there is no choices, but actually in, in uh, so, and humans don't think. They just calculate. They just, they have this function and they optimize it mathematically and they come to a decision and they, they are, human beings are robots. And that's necessary in order to create science because if you want to create a science, you have to have predictability. 
Now what I say is that, and, and what Polani is saying is that no, human beings are free. We can choose, we can choose to go right and we can choose to go left. There is no predictability. As a group we will decide what is the theory we are going to use to analyze and we have a, a quite a bit of flexibility in, in theories. We can uh, choose to use the secular worldview or we can choose to use an Islamic worldview or we can choose to use different but it will have to be a consensus thing. Uh, whatever the group decides, this is our theory, then they will act upon this theory to try to bring about favorable outcomes and this will actually shape history. So it is our choice, what we, how we choose to view the world, that will actually shape how the world becomes. So this is very, very different from a positivist view which, in which one is looking from the outside at a collection of particles which are all following certain laws, so then you can do prediction and forecasting, <coughs> but you can't do it according to the Polanyi methodology. Now, okay, so this is the last thing which uh, Polanyi says which is very different from conventional and basically what he says is that all of the spheres of our life, of our human life, the economic sphere, the political sphere, the social sphere and the environment, these are all interlinked. You cannot analyze one in isolation from another. So you have to think about all of these things simultaneously. The whole, one of the main ideas of the social science current is that we can look at the economic sphere in separation. We don't have to consider politics because economics is its own field and politics is its own field and social society is its own culture, anthropology, etc. These things are different and we can analyze them in isolation. But I say this is not true because they all interact with each other. So, <clears throat> for example, he says that and the external change occurred that machines were invented which had the possibility of mass production. Now this is something which, which happened externally. Now this created a uh, surplus. Now people started thinking what should we do? Now the original concept in all traditional societies was that self-sufficiency is a good thing. And it's still we have some vestiges of that. that we should be self-sufficient. We should not have to import food from outside. Otherwise it can be used as a weapon against us. <coughs> the Japanese after World War II where lots of them starved uh, they said we will grow rice even though the comparative advantage is against that. They, they, it's very expensive to grow rice in Japan but they say that no, we should have our own stock of food even if it is more expensive and they subsidize production. So uh, when you have surplus then both the, the traditional value is that frugality. You should try to live within your means. You don't spend excess and don't buy things you don't have and be self-sufficient. Now the economic thing, when you have a lot of surplus and you want to market it, then these things are coming in your way. So you say, no, frugality is bad. You should go for luxury. The more you have, the better off you have. Our economic theory is teaching us that you should maximize consumption. And this is what everybody does. It's very strange. I mean, not only we are... Economic theory says that this is actually what people do. This is an objective theory. It is not a normative theory according... But this is not what people do, actually. And uh, uh, economic theory is a normative theory because it encourages people to do this. It says that if you do this, you will be rational. Also, you will maximize your utility and if you don't, then you will be irrational and you will also not maximize your utility. So, um, self-sufficiency was destroyed. The theory of comparative advantage emerged because of these surplus. It says that, look, we are producing so much food, you don't need to produce your own food. Why don't you do something else so that we can sell you the food? the surplus that we are putting and you produce something else in surplus and you give it to us. This is actually rather uh, ridiculous if you think about it in natural terms. But this theory emerged as a consequence of the stimulus created by the possibility of surplus productions due to machines. 
So I'm saying that okay, here's the economic sphere, but it is interacting with the uh, well, there's the technological sphere. Some technological change came in. It created the economic change. It also created the social change. Now, uh, greed also is part of this change because unless people are interested in accumulating wealth, nothing will happen with that surplus. You, it will be thrown away. If everybody is self-sufficient and frugal, he says, okay, you have a lot of things. I don't need anything. You just keep it. So what will he do with it? He has produced surplus, which is not of any use to him and not of use to anybody. So this existence of this surplus, when actually initially the um, English and European found, uh, traders found the sea routes and they got to China and they got to India, they had nothing which the Chinese were interested in and they had nothing which the Indians, they, they were in big trouble. So they, they actually created uh, demand by, um, first of all, um, destroying some local economies, then addicting people to tea so that they could uh, uh, sell the tea. Uh, they had problems with, uh, and Chinese would only accept silver. They didn't have silver enough to trade. So they uh, created uh, dependencies which would allow them to sell. And they, they addicted the Chinese to opium. The Chinese law was, this was the opium wars were all, all, all about because uh, the Chinese law was, uh, was against opium but the uh, uh, English traders uh, forced China to open their borders so they could sell them goods so that they could trade with them. So anyway, what I am saying is then the economic fa factors and the political factors, the factors for war, the social factors, they are all interlinked. You can't understand them in isolation. And this is, uh, so this is the, uh, so the, I will end th here. What I am saying is that this is a great opportunity for us because uh, today no one is thinking like that. What they are teaching in Harvard in economics is completely wrong because it's based on uh, these positivist uh, ideas. And we have the opportunity to create a new discipline if we just follow very simple, sensible ideas which are contrary to the positivist thinking, which which was already been proven wrong. It's not that, but I mean, what is happening is that people are taking wrong theories which have been proven wrong and building theories upon them. And so we don't have to follow. Uh, today, all, all that is preventing us from creating new theories is lack of self-confidence. We have, over the past three centuries, we have become used to defeats and since we have been beaten in every field, we say that, okay, they are ahead. Even though, yani, even though when uh, we are taught this theory of utility maximization, our heart says that this is not how I behave. This is not how anyone I know behaves. But we say, oh, Samuel Sen is a Gora Kehra, it must be true. Uh, who am I, a poor, inferior native? My thinking process is defective. So. Uh, even though uh, my thinking process tells me that this is wrong, I don't accept it. I say, okay, I will overrule my uh, experience, I will overrule my thought process, I, I will overrule my observation and I will say, Amanna Saddakna to whatever the Goras is. So this is the thing that is preventing us from creating a new discipline. Okay, so I'll stop here.